truly like SARS 2.0 has re-arrived. Uh, and so something that we've been preparing uh, of, from yearly drills since 2003. Uh, and so uh, this then escalated all the way to the medical offices. And then, of course, we start flight inspections the very next day, the first day of 2020. And so this, in addition to the toll-free number 1922 and many other collective intelligence systems, including the chatbots, Ji Guan Jia, and so on, allowed the entire Chinese society to crowdsource, as you are doing now uh, on Slido, the best responses uh, in real time, responding to the actual situation at hand, uh, instead of just a handful of uh, experts who may be like uh, very professional, but certainly is not everywhere in Taiwan, right? Uh, and so this is, I think, at the core of our digital social innovation system, uh, which is fast, fair, and fun. Okay, uh, and now we have some questions, so <laughs> I'll just move to the question for the next 15 minutes. Okay. Um, the five people would like to um, ask me, whom do I think will win the election? Uh, it's Trump or Biden, right? So uh, my answer to that uh, is that if we think about this, deliberate about this, uh, and gather all the information about it, and think very closely for two weeks, then we will arrive at a result. Uh, and so, and, and someone will win, <laughs> Trump or Biden will win. Um, so, so and, and that's, I think, what everybody um, with a scientific training can, can say nowadays is a probability thing, and I, I do not know who will win for sure. But if you're interested in that, there's um, like Nathan Silva's um, website, uh, and so on, many other Posters website that you can consult. Um, two people would like to know how was it that decided to utilize the information technology to address the threat of COVID? Very good question. Interestingly, um, when SARS 1.0 um, gets um, to Taiwan. Um, that was around the time when we uh, in Penghu, in the Pescadura Islands, started rolling out the IC card of our National Health Insurance card. Uh, and it actually made a really good case of the use of the IC card, especially in the time of pandemic, because first it reduced the chore of the handwritten National Insurance card, and also it allowed the IC card to automatically dispatch into the system of early responses without having to wait uh, for people to to tally the statistics at the end of the day. So the uh, pilot um, test in the Pescadora Island in Penghu was quite successful, and SARS 1.0 is actually one of the um, digital transformation uh, impetus that um, convinced the people in uh, mainland Taiwan, uh, the main island, uh, that we also want something like an IC card uh, in the Penghu Island. I, I bring this up because uh, in this time, people instinctively think about the national um, health insurance card because it covers not only 99.99% of citizens but residents too because in a time of um, the coronavirus or any other pandemic um, if we do not protect the people who may not have a citizenship status may not have the voting rights or, or whatever uh, then uh, they actually um, are the most vulnerable people when it comes to the pandemic uh, and so people think of the national health insurance cards as something that's maximally inclusive uh, which is good because people who are uh, born I think just takes three days or four days to get a national health insurance card uh, and so it's, it's on everybody's mind and also for the past four years We've been um, adjusting our procurement strategy. Instead of a siloed applications that works uh, toward each agency's goals, when procuring information technology services from system integrators, uh, we have nationalized the standard, the open API standard from the Linux Foundation. So um, if you have used a website before in Taiwan, the government website, you may notice three, um, like, um, columns uh, in the top left corner, uh, and it's like six dots, uh, looks like a braille uh, display. Um, and if you see that, it means that it's accessible, it's universally accessible for people with blindness, for people who do not see well and so on. They can use all sorts of assistive technologies to read aloud the website and interact normally uh, as people with sight. Um, and this same procurement principle that convinced all the, well, forced all the system integrators to work with accessibility standards, we extended four years ago. 
<coughs> to work with machine-to-machine -machine, um, protocols. So if they build a website, build an information system, and say it's only good for humans to use, <coughs> but not good for other machines to use, then we can disqualify them the same way that we disqualify the information vendors that are not uh, accessible, uh, saying that they discriminate against robots or something. Well, we don't quite say that, but the procurement rule says that uh, in effect. Uh, and so because of that, when we built those systems, for example, the newer system of tax filing software and so on, um, all of them have this kind of plug and play, uh, Lego block like modularity in it through the APIs, the application programming interfaces. And that's what enabled all of this to be uh, hooked into the National Health Insurance uh, card system so that we can, for example, rationale the mask reusing the same user interface of refilling a uh, chronic uh, prescription uh, from the pharmacies uh, because that's what people are already familiar with and that's how we can uh, then use the NHI card like filing a local tax and a local convenience store and all in all the 6,000 or more pharmacists and the 12,000 or more convenience stores all together enable the mask rationing system. There's many other examples uh, because for the interest of time I'll just use this one example but the API over KPI is very important when it comes to procurement. All right. Um, what and how do you do with ICT technology to help the reopening of the border for traveling? Excellent question. Um, one of the most important uh, border control measure in Taiwan is the digital fence. Uh, and in digital fence, again, we do not collect new data uh, that we didn't collect before the pandemic. Because if we do that, then the privacy implications, uh, the cybersecurity implications uh, will be not as well understood. Uh, if we make a new technology during the pandemic, then of course people can be reasonably wary of this new technology. And the digital fence uses tried and true technology technology, which is the same technology that people receive a SMS when there is an earthquake, advanced earthquake warning, or an evacuation warning when there is a sudden flood, uh, both of which happens quite often in Taiwan, uh, well, except typhoon, which doesn't happen this year. But anyway, so people understand that the SMS, of course, doesn't read your email. It doesn't infringe uh, any of your application layer uh, security. It works regardless of whether you have Bluetooth or GPS or um, even Wi-Fi uh, or any of the other connectivity technology it doesn't know where you are, you just know roughly where you are in the vicinity. And so based on this uh, design principle, we make sure that when people uh, who choose to home quarantine instead of going to a physical quarantine hotel, in those 14 days, we make sure that the digital fence works in a way that's minimally privacy uh, invasive, and by the time that they finish the quarantine, then they're uh, okay with that. Um, and because the telecoms never really share the data to other um, companies and so on, there's minimal chance of the uh, leak of the privacy information. Uh, and so after, of course, we uh, explained how the system works in a parliamentary interpolation and public hearing uh, session, the approval rates of the CECC measures uh, grow from 91% to 94%, but we still thank the other 6% for keeping us honest and accountable. Uh, and when we're uh, now gradually opening up the borders uh, and uh, uh, providing for, for example, like important diplomatic bubbles and things like that. Um, it turns out that we can actually uh, repurpose this triangulation so that it's not a static bubble, but rather a moving bubble. Uh, so that the bubble can travel with the person if they have a, a prefixed um, like schedule of tra travel to make sure that they do not, for example, suddenly take public transportation uh, or things like that. And all of this, of course, are still within the constitutional limit because we never declare a state uh, of emergency and that enable a more flexible way of working with the digital quarantine measures. Uh, so now, now I'm supposed to uh, translate uh, the Mandarin questions to English. Okay, Let, let's see how I work as an interpreter. So eight people would like to know, uh, because of the um, good um, record uh, when countering the pandemic uh, with no lockdowns, um, then the international status of Taiwan um, has risen, or at least people talk about Taiwan more. Uh, from my perspective, uh, such a good performance, uh, is there something that's still missing from it? Uh, and which are the missing angles? And how can we convert those good performances uh, into a slogan that will enable more meaningful participation uh, of Taiwan into the World Health Organization or the United Nations uh, and how to enable this kind of functions? This is an excellent question. 
So we already have a re really good slogan, and I believe that uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs worked with the Ministry of Health and Welfare uh, on that slogan a couple of years ago. And it's called Health for All, Taiwan Can Help. Uh, and this is our, our main message. Um, before, people think of Taiwan and WHO or UN and think Taiwan needs help. But after <laughs> that uh, slogan uh, rose out, uh, we flipped the narrative saying that actually, you know, we, we don't really need the, the help. We were doing quite well. But if you want to counter the pandemic or if you want to counter the infodemic that's associated with the pandemic without resorting to authoritarian measures, if you want to keep your democracy and your economy while fighting uh, the pandemic, then really there really is nothing um, that prevents you from looking at the Taiwan model, learning from the Taiwan model, because we're a country with good open innovation records. We will co-create this model with you. And so this is, uh, I think, a really good angle, a really good narrative. And when you um, just spread it out, the idea that it's not a zero-sum game between public health on one side and human rights and privacy on the other. Or when it comes to an infodemic, it's not a forced choice uh, between the freedom of the press, of the speech, and so on on one side, and the public awareness and resilience against cognitive um, warfare, right? Uh, and this is what Taiwan have time and time again proven and just published uh, in, for example, Taiwan Can Help That Us, which is a great website and it's not even <coughs> sponsored by the government it's crowdfunded maybe by you right it's crowdfunded and crowdsourced by some very young youtubers uh, and sharing the Taiwan model uh, to the um, all the audiences uh, across the world so I think that answers the narrative question and so <coughs> are there anything missing from it well I, I think um, it's often um, kind of overlooked how important the trust from the government to the citizen is. So I often tell the story of how the CECC, the Central Epidemic Command Center, decide not to impose any penalty or to fo force closure uh, of the intimate drinking bars and dancing clubs when it uh, occurs that the contact tracing and their uh, professional respect of privacy uh, may be at odds. Instead of the CECC just said, uh, we trust the business owners to do the right thing. We explain the scientific crux of physical distancing. And then they co-created this real contact system or instead of the real name system that says as long as we can contact the people there uh, within the last uh, two weeks in any business they don't have to uh, give this data to the central epidemic command center they can shred it after a few weeks and then they come up with single-use emails prepaid sim cards or things like that uh, to uh, both keep the contact and also keep their professional respect of their privacy and once they did that the municipal uh, governments uh, gradually just um, allowed the um, intimate drinking bars and dancing clubs to reopen. I use this example to talk with many um, other CECC equivalents in other countries uh, because first it's not intuitive at all. When something like that happens, uh, the CECC in other jurisdictions tend to choose the other way, which is to uh, just force them underground, essentially. Uh, but also it shows uh, the Pygmalion effect in work. If the government trusts the citizens, then citizens become trustworthy and become co-creators. But if you start by saying, okay, these are others, these are people who deserve to be underground, then of course you create vulnerabilities within your own uh, population. I think this is an angle that uh, we need to um, emphasize more because I think this more truly explains why the Taiwan model works so well without any top-down, shutdown, lockdown um, mechanisms. Um, Ten people would like to know. So there's many information and communication technology being applied in Taiwan. However, um, many um, official agencies develop their own systems. Uh, every municipal systems, every city-wide systems may uh, work very well within that area, but they do not uh, work horizontally. Uh, and so. Um, for each clinic or hospital for they to join various projects. The same data needs to be entered many times. So can we interact uh, through those systems instead of forcing uh, the clinics or hospital or people uh, responsible for data entry to enter repeatedly the same data to various different systems? This is an excellent question. And the answer is yes. Um, we are uh, now testing a technology called a T-Road technology that would enable 
any two agencies within the government service network uh, who has, um, of course, that's the legal authorization to exchange this data in the first place. Um, it's basically the same as uh, the previous arrangement of shipping CD-ROMs or shipping SFTP uh, or whatever uh, around, which is a very unmanageable topology uh, and uh, it makes like building new connections horizontally harder than just requiring the person uh, to enter multiple entries. So because of it's harder, so people don't bother doing it. But now with T-Road, uh, each and every agency have to only install one adapter that converts their legacy uh, software entry points into the API endpoints for the T-Road to uh, hook into. And then there's a API management mechanism in each and every ministry, there are 32 of them, uh, that will then enable this kind of agency to agency uh, exchange of information so you can query these data as if they are stored locally because there's a way to exchange uh, this data. But we can both trace, the, it's very auditable, uh, we can trace the flow of the information and as a uh, person, as an individual, you can go to the My Data portal at mydata. I think N-A-T-G-O-V-T-W uh, or just search for my data uh, and then use your well national health insurance card uh, or, or other uh, digital certificates uh, and then you can see which agencies hold your data and you can also audit their use of your data if you uh, saw that uh, your data has been entered uh, incorrectly and so on. Previously there you have to call like five different agencies to get it updated uh, but eventually through the combination of the my data portal and hopefully uh, by next year, uh, our uh, data protection authority, our independent authority for data protection, uh, then you can do this in a much more streamlined fashion. Uh, so it's actually easy to remember the T-Row is the horizontal connection between agencies, and my data is this vertical download of each and every individual and the exercise of their data rights. I think we only have time for one last um, question. So the question is, um, so after 5G or uh, during the 5G deployment, how will Taiwan change and how will it impact the medical profession? I think what 5G brings is that the kind of real-time uh, response that whenever you uh, post your Slido question, we're watching this live stream, you can see me nodding and so on, but there is a, a perceptible delay if we're using live stream platforms. Even with the state-of-the-art uh, televideo conferencing platforms, it requires both sides to have good fiber optic connection and then an Ethernet connection so that we can feel that we are actually in the same room, uh, which is what uh, we have invested a lot because we have broadband as a human right. But there's a limitation in 4G technology, not about the bandwidth, but about the latency. So when you're outdoors, when you're using 4G technology, it never feels quite the same as being in the same room or in a, a high-speed connection uh, through the fiber optic lines. Uh, so f what 5G does to me already, because I've been using 5G uh, for the couple past three months now, uh, anyway, so the uh, experience that I had through 5G to video conference with people um, is that I can feel the same low latency feeling of co-presence that we're actually in the same room. I actually work uh, a lot with say the XR space, uh, virtual reality headset, which is not just a VR headset that is controller free, I can just control using my hand, but it's uh, by itself a 5G um, phone. And so it can work anywhere outdoors and it has a pair of camera so I can scan anywhere I'm in, for example this room, and then I just scan the VR um, room and send a share link to anyone with another XR space device and they can then join me in the same room and if we're both using 5G, once they nod, once they smile and so on, I can get the signal immediately in my eyes so that uh, there's a lot of empty seats here so I can put on the VR and still seeing you folks but then the empty chairs, suddenly all the live stream participants appear in the virtual chairs here and so this will make a true co presence feeling that will enable a lot of uh, the care work that was previously inaccessible through this very code and laggy two-dimensional uh, piece of glass uh, to join more of the not just the medical but also the healthcare uh, industry. So I really look forward to the day where we're not restrained uh, by the fiber optic lines but could in any rural places, any indigenous lands, uh, any high mountains and so on enjoy the same level of person-to-person -person care through 5G technology. Thank you for the questions. Thank you.
So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Tang. Uh, and so there's a lot of questions unanswered, but uh, we can certainly carry on uh, the discussions uh, in the end of our panel discussions. I just wonder how many, uh, how many people in the audience who are for the first time to listen uh, to uh, Minister Tang's uh, speech. How many people, you are the first time? Okay, then congratulations, welcome. Because you are seeing, uh, you know, this is really the future communications. Uh, uh, you will uh, get used to it. I mean, uh, uh, this is my second time and I feel really enjoyed it. Anyway, uh, we will talk about uh, the topic later on. Uh,